Hi everyone, this is uh, Dr. Zeus Almianos, PhD, and uh, better known in my citizen Zeus capacity as a citizen informer that goes beyond the typical left-right debates and starts getting at the heart of the issues by doing deep investigative reporting, uh, scientifically minded, rational, intuitive uh, investigation into the major issues of our time. I go past the headlines and dig into the actual scientific articles and I translate it into uh, language that anyone can understand. Uh, oftentimes I'm doing much research, many hours of research to consolidate into these 40, 45 minute pieces and I'm gonna try to do a few shorter ones. So if you do like this film, uh, please um, visit my site at citizenzeus.com uh, and donate uh, or, um, or you can also go to my YouTube channel which is Citizen Zeus, the one that's not the clothing company but the other one and, uh, and listen to some of the other videos as well. Uh, I'm welcome feedback, so please do um, feel free to do that as well. Today, I'm really getting into the issues that surround uh, COVID-19 with regard to a lot of the contradictory information out there. I've heard from a lot of people, yourself, you've probably been engaged in some of these conversations as well. Do ventilators work or don't they? Look like you shouldn't smoke. And then, oh, wait, looks like smokers do better with COVID masks first they were saying don't wear them and they don't do any good then they were saying you have to wear them again when you start getting a steady stream of contradiction that's so obvious it's important to begin to look at things and one of the most important things to look at is what is the nature of COVID-19 itself is it truly a respiratory disease or is it as I have researched it a more primarily a blood and nerve disease that manifests in respiratory symptoms and it can, of course, that's important because it does help to answer the ventilator question. If you're having problems with your blood and you just try to force oxygen into your lungs, it's not going to uh, take care of the problem. So we're going to do some deep dive into this right now. I'm going to put myself in the corner here and basically put out the, the thesis statement here. COVID-19 is a blood nerve disease. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask, use ventilators, don't use ventilators. Vitamin D and C won't work. Hey, wait, yes, they will. Don't smoke, hey, wait, smokers seem less likely to die from the disease. COVID-19 is a, uh, a respiratory disease. No, wait, it's a blood nerve disease. We will clear up these contradictions in the following two-part series using a critical examine, examination of peer-reviewed science and not conspiracy theory or blind obedience to authority or so-called experts who understand only a slice of the pie. And there's where you see the real problem in so much of this. We have learned in the industrial society to specialize our tasks and have a basically a confidence or understanding that the system will somehow serve us. What we've gotten now, especially with the intrusion of political corruption, economic global uh, intervention, is the levers of coordination for those different specialisms have now become almost hopefully, hopelessly compromised. And it becomes difficult to begin to knit things back together without a comprehensive, insightful, investigative journey into the actual material. That's why I use peer-reviewed scientific articles and I begin to bring those together with popular articles to really circle in on what is the nature of our life and the challenges we are facing. Uh, in terms of this, I have a two-parter coming up for you. This is gonna be part one, having to do with whether vitamins D and C help uh, with regard to this, and if so, how? And then my second part is going to have to do with cytokine storms. And it went to that notion of this unusual uh, discovery that cigarette smokers somehow were much, much underrepresented in the COVID mortality, that is the COVID death rate. So people were saying, well, that doesn't make any sense. It's a respiratory disease and smokers are doing better. Turns out it's the nicotine aspect of that smoke, and we'll look into that. But for part one here, let's just look at it. Vitamin D does appear to help regulate and repair pathological or overactive immune responses in a variety of ways. I'm gonna show you in this video how COVID-19 is primarily a blood and slash nerve disease and creating clots, creating problems with the blood that then manifest in the lungs, preventing the oxygen from being up uh, taken up there. Um, and what happens is it turns out vitamin D is a common, common factor. And I will show you the studies on this that limits inflammation, normalizes the, the blood fluid electrolyte balance, 
in the blood and in the body, reduces lung damage, supports functioning of a vascular smooth muscle, which improves blood flow, improves uh, insulin resistance. You're talking about diabetes in these, which were factors, uh, risk factors for this disease, limits and buffers heart stress, uh, myocardial cell hypertrophy. This means a, a uh, cells enlarging in the heart. It has anti-clotting and anti-fibrotic uh, properties. That's very important because COVID-19 has these strange blood clotting things where they're pulling the blood out of the body and it's clotting as they're pulling it out. It's just way, way overactive and overcharged. And it also modulates macrophages, a macrophage uh, activation syndrome and autoimmune overactivation. When the blood, when the when the body is unbalanced and it sends the wrong messages, oftentimes you can create what's called a cytokine storm. That's in the next line here, where immune cells destroy the body. Vitamin D plays a role in limiting that response. And vitamin D is also associated with lower death rate in COVID-19 patients. It reduces the risk of infections. Vitamin D deficiency is implicated in obesity, diabetes, and cancer. And vitamin D protects against the damaging effects of electronic pollution. I'm gonna go over all of those and a little bit on vitamin C, uh, which does many of these same kinds of things, but in particular, it reduces the cytokine storm for acute respiratory distress syndrome, and it helps with severe infection recovery, including viral pneumonia, and it reduces intensive care stays. So again, these are not just fly-by-night uh, naturopathic or urban myths. These are actually going to be shown to be the case in reviewed articles. So again, Instead of getting into the anti-vaxxer and pro-vaxxer debate where the pro-vaxxer is basically saying, oh, that's all a bunch of junk. You have to trust conventional medicine. And a lot of people on the other side saying, oh, I would never take a vaccine ever under any circumstances. I'm only going to look at uh, what I believe my gut says and what my friends say and maybe a few of my naturopathic doctors recommend. In this, you're going to get a middle vaxxer approach again where you aren't trying to come out to disprove vaccines. You're not trying to come out to support them. When you're trying to come out is actually focusing on what we should be focusing on is health itself, how our system works, how it interfaces with this disease and how we can go forward. So let me jump on the first thing here. This is from the NPR.org. Uh, um, uh, I just want to open with this to, 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 to stress how much um, how much there is already death created by medical error. And medical error, I believe, is the re result of specialism. It's also the result of overwork of nurses and a culture uh, of capitalism in which you're trying to crank through as many people as possible. Again, I'm in favor of what I call democratic capitalism, which is money serving people rather than corrupted capitalism where people serve money. And when it comes to life and death, money ought to serve the people and oftentimes in the traditional medical system, it is not. So um, it's estimated here in this study, a recent study here, that over 250,000 Americans die each year from medical errors. But here's what I think is notable, because when science, uh, conventional medicine says, we're based in science and so forth, and we really wanna write things down, and we want to make sure on the cause of death and so forth. When it comes to medical error, they do everything they can to cover it up. I'll read the uh, <clears throat> passage here. Medical mistakes that can lead to death range from surgical complications that go unrecognized to mix up with the doses or types of medications patients receive. No one knows the exact toll taken by medical errors. In significant part, that's because the coding system used by the CDC, the Centers of Disease Control, to record death certificate data doesn't capture things like communication breakdowns, diagnostic errors, and poor judgment that cost lives, the study says. Quote, you have this overappreciation and overestimate of things like cardiovascular disease and a vast underrecognition of the place of medical care as the cause of death. Marlarkey said in an interview, that informs all our healthcare priorities and our research grants. Notice two things here. One, they happen to not record the things that will give them liability or take money away from them, being responsible for creating a death. That's what a good scientist would do. That's what a good statistician would do. That is someone who is pro-people and wants to make sure people don't die would do. On the other hand, if you want to make more money and you don't want to lose it through suits or liability or even 
learning what you're doing better, uh, you would take the other approach. Again, this is, this is in the NPR article, medical errors are the number three cause of youth death, researchers say. I have the uh, link up there and I will provide it as I will all the references down below um, in the description of this video. Now, here's a, a snapshot of, of someone who is brought into this particular um, hospital uh, within hours. Here's at, at admission, four hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, and 72 hours. So within three days, what you see is this progression of kind of a mottling and clumping and clotting of bloods in the micro capillaries in the alveolar sacs. Now those are the small sacs that your lung makes up to increase the surface area of your lungs. And that's where all the oxygen transfer happens from the blood between the blood and the lungs. So when, when I first got worded this, and it, it was a couple of a month and a half ago that this was happening, I said to myself, aha, I'm betting this is a blood disease and only represented uh, uh, secondarily as, as, a, as a acute lung distress disease. Because of course, if you have no ability to get oxygen into, uh, into your blood, because the capillaries are all clotting up, and those, those clotting is creating a situation in your lungs where you can't get mucus and you can't get the flow necessary to get waste products out, that would manifest as an acute lung disease or respiratory disease, but its actual foundation or basis is in the blood. And I'm also going to show you it's in the nerves as well. So it's taken us a while to find that, but a recent article in The Lancet seems to confirm that this is in fact the case. I will uh, talk about the, um, the relevant passage. This is in, uh, again, in the summary, immune mechanisms of pulmonary intervascular coagulopathy. Now, coagulopathy simply just means disease. Pathy means disease and coagulus means clotting. So it's basically a clotting disease in COVID-19 pneumonia. And here's what's happening. The immune mechanism, remember I had said in my other video that this is an immune disease or an autoimmune disease, and it looks like I'm being proven right in the recent studies. The immune mechanism underlying diffuse alveolar and pulmonary interstitial inflammation in COVID-19 involves an MAS-like trigger, macrophage activation syndrome, we'll talk about that, that, that triggers extensive immunothrombosis. Again, that means thrombosis is this clotting or clumping having to do with the immune system, which might unmask subclinical cardiovascular disease and is distinct from MAS and disseminated intravascular coagulation. So basically all they're saying is that what this does, this challenge that comes from the immune system that creates, that contributes to this clotting and clumping, because remember immune system does bring cells around a clump around a, uh, an alien uh, bacteria or protein to dissolve it. But if it gets overactivated, it could clump around anything and it can start really creating some serious clotting. So this then, just like something in your car that's gone wrong, puts a pressure on another part of it, it also does the same with your body. Putting pressure on your heart and cardiovascular diseases and weak uh, aortas and uh, arteries and veins, but it also, of course, begins to affect your lungs. So the primary source here is what's happening in your blood, in your veins, associated with your immune system, and it's manifesting as cl irregular clotting that is beginning to affect both your hearts, especially people who have risks and, and weaker hearts or weaker arteries, and also in your lungs in these microclots that are preventing oxygen from getting into the body. This is the actual paper. Um, I'm just putting this up there so you can see it. Um, the other one was, was basically a reprint of that, and I will again copy this so you can look directly at the sources. Um, the next one has to do with uh, Science Daily. And again, I thought this was very important. I'll look up there. Blood clotting and abnormalities reveal COVID-19 patients at risk of thrombotic events. Again, we're talking about the same thing, throm thrombosis. And we'll discuss thrombosis uh, a little bit, just so you know what it is. But here is a, here's the critical passage. Patients who are critically ill, regardless of cause, can develop a condition known as disseminated intravascular coagulation. Well, it's a fancy word for this. 
the blood of these patients initially forms many clots in small blood vessels, just like in the lungs, in the capillaries, in the alveoli, um, in the small sacs, okay? Uh, the body's natural clotting factors can form too much clot of eventually not able to be effectively form any clot leading to tissues of both, or uh, leading to, uh, to issues of both excessive clotting and excessive bleeding. However, in patients with COVID-19, the clotting appears to be particularly severe and as evidenced by case studies in China and elsewhere, clots in COVID-19 patients do not appear to dissipate. They, they, they clump, but the mechanism to allow them to dissipate is, is not there. So that begins then to stick and create these mini clots in the lungs and clots around. And it probably could also create heart attacks and other kinds of things if a person had compromised arteries. So that's, that's an important point there. Again, blood disease, blood immune system, nerve disease. I'll show you about the nervous part. Um, here's the JAMA network. Um, a lot of people are talking about ventilators. Are they dangerous? Are they needed? I think more and more they're finding out that, it, that, and they actually did this, when they found out that this clotting was an issue, they were able to buy better time or more time for these people with anti-clotting agents, uh, chemicals that would thin your blood and so forth. This is interesting because again, this is, um, this is a Journal of American Medical Association not that long ago, April 26, presenting characteristics, comorbidities, that just means the, the factors that go together to create death for somebody. It's usually not just one thing, it's a bunch of things. So comorbidities just, just means all the factors. And notice here in this passage, as of April 4th, for patients requiring me mechanical ventilation, only 3.3% were discharged alive. So clearly that ventilation may, it's, it's the last bit measure. It's kind of like those paddles, those charged paddles when you're trying to jolt someone's heart back into it, but it hasn't been very successful. 3.3% were discharged alive, 24.5% died, and the remainder remained in the hospital. And they may make it, they may not, but as an initial thing, it's not really helping that much. Again, why wouldn't it help? Well, as I've shown you, if you're trying to force oxygen into a system that is clotted and not exchanging that oxygen and moving it through the body, you're basically just, it's like trying to put your mouth around a fire hose. There's no way to get that into you. So again, I'm hoping that people are beginning to recognize that there are other ways and you have to treat the foundational problem for COVID-19 and not simply look at the symptoms. Next one we have here very important article. What seems to be a key? Now, many doctors, naturopathic doctors from the beginning were from everywhere from right wing to left wing to center to progressive to way out there was saying, let's look at the therapies that are going to help our bodies internally deal with this. And let's look at where our bodies are weak or are deficient. And many people are deficient in vitamin D. And what they found, and I'm gonna show you this, is that vitamin D was an incredibly predictive factor for death from COVID-19. Why? Now that we've identified that, that COVID-19 is mostly a blood disease, and I'm doing another thing on this because there were a lot of talk about an AIDS fragment from HIV being inserted into the spike protein that allow COVID-19 virus to be infectious to humans. I've already done some, a video on this called Hybridizing Harm, where I show how that gain of function was created in a lab and either uh, and attached to a natural organism. And I'm not sure the mechanism about how it got out, maybe it got out from the lab directly. I speculate that it did by accident. But if an HIV uh, glycoprotein or uh, um, compound or whatever was inserted into this, it would allow for that to happen. I'm not going to do that now. I will do that in a separate video. But what does vitamin D do directly to deal with this problem of thrombosis and homeostasis of the immune system and the blood that keeps it from going wild, like wildly clotting and then sticking there and not, 
know, uh, dispersing or dissipating. Here's what it is. It says D3 regulates the renin angiotensin system, the RAS system. We'll talk about that. Suppresses proliferation of vascular cell, uh, cell smooth muscle. Remember my intro at the beginning. Improves insulin resistance. This goes to diabetes. Uh, endothelial cell dependent vasodilation, the expansion and allowance of blood to go through your system. Again, heart, heart cell hypertrophy, hypertrophy. It inhibits that, and inhibits the inflammation of the heart. And a lot of this secondary cause is inflammation of the organs because of the way that this blood is acting. The immune system and the blood together are acting and exerts anticoagulant and antifibrotic activity. So these things that create the clots, it's, it helps them disaggregate, it helps them to break apart, and it mod modulates macrophage activity and cytokine generation. That's the immune system part, okay? We have something called cyto cyto cytokine storms that create a situation, like I said in the intro, in which your, your immune system is just so hyped up, it's just attacking everything. Vitamin D modulates that as well. So that's an overall of this, and I will go to the next one. What is immunothrombosis? That's one of these things that have happened. We talked about vitamin D dealing with inflation, uh, inflation, inflammation here, but we also, it helps to deal with uh, immunothrombosis. Thrombosis is the formation of blood coagulation and platelet aggregation that may result in lack of blood throw through the circulatory system. There you go. It's creating a system where the oxygen that's delivered through the lungs can't actually get into the body and oxygen uptake goes down, and that's how they measure a person's functionality with COVID-19. So the depletion of oxygen may cause irreversible damage to organs. Again, that's another thing that was shown, inflammation and damage to organs in COVID-19 patients. Again, it's related to this. However, in other circumstances, a physiological process can be beneficial for the body. This process is known as immunothrombosis. The process isolates infections using blood clots formed by activated platelets, okay, remember? When it's functioning right, these things do uh, come clot around and surround the, the wrong guys <laughs> so that the body can eliminate them. When it's not, it just goes crazy and starts going around. Even your own cells are just out of nowhere just doing it. It's just, it can't make any discernment or distinction. Again, fibrin is involved in this. Um, uh, again, so, so there's a, a homeostatic mechanism in the body that helps make this work for you instead of against you. You bring these platelets, these fibrins together, they're supposed to attack the things, surround them, destroy them, and then disperse. And when that gets interrupted, as it does with COVID-19, all of a sudden the clots are staying and preventing oxygen from getting into the body. So, uh, so here's what it says in the end here. It says, the shift from immunothrombosis, that's the good kind, to more pathogenic thrombosis, that's a bad kind where it just sticks and it's not really even distinguishing which cells to go after, is due to a dysregulated immunothrombosis. So something is unregulating that. And one of the things that unregulates that is vitamin D deficiency. If you do not have proper vitamin D, your regulation of immunothrombosis to make it work properly versus in a destructive way is, um, is seriously hampered. So vitamin D becomes more and more important as we go through. The RAS system, we talked about that. Again, vitamin D helps this function also normally. Is an abnormally active, uh, <clears throat> if, it, if it is uh, abnormally active, again, this is when it goes crazy, right? And you don't have vitamin D and other things to help bring it into a normal, healthy response. Blood pressure will be too high. There are many drugs that interrupt different steps in the system to lower blood pressure. These drugs are one of the primary ways to control high blood pressure, heart failure, and kidney failure, and harmful effects of diabetes. So again, vitamin D deficiency creates these problems in your blood, and then they try to bring drugs in to treat them. Of course, these drugs are very expensive, and uh, without even getting into conspiracy theory, you can say, well, why don't they just try vitamin D? Well, they're beginning to. Uh, the industry suppresses that because they would lose a lot of revenue if we found simple and inexpensive ways for your own internal system to deal with it rather than taking an external substance to create something in your body. Because as we know, those have side effects too. Whereas if you can get your system to work from the inside, not only does it cost less, almost inevitably, 
but it also creates a vigor, just like fitness. You know, not just having uh, surgery done on your body to remove fat, but actually exercising to remove it. Think about the difference between that, the internal approach versus the external approach. Less money for the medical industry, much better for you. Um, and again, we, they talked about the role of, uh, of vitamin D in vascular smooth muscles. Uh, these cells, these play an important role, not only in the physiological function of the blood vessels, such as vasoconstriction, which is making them smaller or making them vasodilation, making them bigger and extracellular matrix production, but also in the pathogenesis of vascular diseases. Pathogenesis means the creation of disease, okay? Particularly atherosclerosis and hypertension. So again, this is what happens when your body is out of whack. Again, this is taken again from another peer reviewed um, chapter, you know, in a, in a scientific text. So I'm not just taking this from any place. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and here's a macro, uh, again, vitamin C, uh, uh, vitamin D, sorry, can uh, help with a macrophage, macrophage activation syndrome. Um, and what causes this syndrome where this, this thing goes crazy? Um, and first of all, what is it? It's a severe, potentially life-threatening complication of several chronic rheumatic diseases of childhood. But what's interesting in here Going back to what I have in my other video, when I talk, when I relate COVID-19 to autoimmune response, is these are a lot of these are autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases and macrophages are supposed to go ahead and surround and take out bad things. When you have an autoimmune disease, those macrophages come out, they become activated, and they start taking out your own cells. You look at something like lupus. This is an autoimmune disease where literally you're being attacked, your own cells are being attacked. Juvenile arthritis is literally inflammation happening because these macrophages are attacking your joints and other things. So there is a big connection here. If vitamin D and if COVID-19 is involved in dysregulating your macrophage activation you know, system, then we can already begin to see, um, reading what it says, in many cases, a trigger is identified, often a viral infection or a medication. I've made this argument about vaccines can oftentimes cause these problems because they have so many bad things in them. You can watch my other films. I do an important job, a pretty thorough job of looking at those. But to continue, there's uncontrolled activation and proliferation of macrophages and T lymphocytes with a marked increase in cytokines, okay? The underlying causative event is unclear, they say, and is subject to ongoing research, okay? In many cases, MAS or macrophage activation syndrome is a decreased natural killer cells function. Now, natural killer cells, to go back, are unique cells that are independent, okay? Um, they can recognize and kill stress cells in the absence of antibodies, okay? So they're faster immune response. They're the first responders and they're named natural killers because their initial notion is that they do not require activation to kill cells and are missing self markers. Um, so again, that first line of defense is lessened when your whole body is being messed with and when you have vitamin D deficiency. So let's go to the next one here. It's a National Geographic article. Uh, why coronavirus's weirdest symptoms are only emerging now. Uh, you can see that again, I have, I'm including the, um, the, uh, URLs in the videos. So you can always pause this at any time if you want to look at that video and I will also have them in the description. I don't want to basically waste the time getting to there. Uh, you know, here we, we sometimes have to scroll up. This is what the thing looks like. Inflamed brains, toe rashes, strokes, why COVID-19's weirdest symptoms are only emerging now. And here's what it says. COVID-19 starts as a respiratory disease. No, it doesn't. It starts as a blood disease and then manifests as, as a respiratory disease. It's true. The way that this virus enters the body is through the respiratory system, but its real damage is not done directly to the lungs. Its real damage is getting into the bloodstream, into the immune system, and I would even say into the nervous system, and creating a dysregulated immune system that begins to cr cr create clotting, macrophage activation, and all these other things, and is directly related to vitamin D deficiency. So let's get it straight here, people, okay? It doesn't start as respiratory disease. It's transferred through respiration 
goes into the blood and manifests as a respiratory disease. And the virus it invades cells in the nose, throat and lungs and starts to replicate, causing flu-like symptoms that can progress to pneumonia and even punch holes in your lung, leaving permanent scars. For many patients, that's the worst of it. Again, yes, the places where these things can link up, uh, and we will show this, are these ACE2 sites. In these often found in the mucus, and it invades those areas. Those are kind of like flagship cells to try to find out what's going on and what's going wrong in a body. So they're literally the flag markers for the problem areas in the bodies. And these COVID-19 viruses are burrowing into them and hijacking them and piggybacking with them into your lungs, into your mucus cells and other parts of your body, including your blood. But for others, now this is important, immune system inexplicably goes haywire and their bodies release proteins called cytokines, alarm beacons that help recruit immune cells to the site of an infection. If too many cytokines leak into the bloodstream and fill the body, immune cells start killing anything they can encounter. This response called a cytokine storm, which you see in autoimmune diseases as well, um, <clears throat> creates massive inflammation that weakens the blood vessels, causing fluid to seep into the lungs air sacs. It also creates organ inflammation, by the way, triggering respiratory failure. A cytokine storm can damage the liver or kidneys and result in multi-organ failure. We're seeing that in kids. I showed that in a past video when they had this thing called multiple organ you know, inflammation syndrome. This is exactly what's happening in these kids that are getting COVID toes and also um, inflamed organs. Again, vitamin D is something that is going to help with that. I just thought I'd do this. When you hear the words antigen and antibody, a lot of times those get confusing. Antigens are the molecules capable of stimulating the immune response. So the COVID virus and other performed proteins are an antigen. And when they test for antigens, they just test for the pre presence of that foreign protein in your body. Antibodies, on the other hand, are those things your body creates in response to and to defend events and to attack the antigens. So Antibodies or immunoglobins or Y-shaped proteins produced by the B cells of the immune system in response to exposure to antigens. Okay, and again, to, to try to tag them and then to eliminate them because they're getting uh, in the way of your body's functioning. So here's an article on WebMD. Uh, blood clots are another dangerous COVID-19 mystery. It's not so much a, a, a mystery now if you really begin to put the pieces together, but I'll read what they say. Around the world, Doctors caring for COVID patients have been trying to make sense of the same thing. When they draw blood from COVID patients, it clots in the tubes. When nurses insert catheters for di uh, kidney dialysis and IV lines to draw blood, the tubes quickly become clogged with clots. That's how bad this is. Quote, patients are making clots all over the place, says Adam Cooker, MD, a, a hematologist and associate professor of medicine at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, that's making management of these patients very challenging. In addition to the well-known breathing problems, blood clots are a significant danger for COVID-19 patients. <laughs> In addition to the breathing problems, I'd say at the heart of the breathing problems. Anyway, clots are causing patients with COVID to have heart attacks and strokes. We've already gone over that. Form strange rashes in their skin, get red swollen wounds that look like frostbite on their fingers and toes. On autopsy, the small vessels of the lungs and bowels, liver and kidneys of COVID patients are choked with clots. Again, if we needed any extra proof, there it is. What I, what I found, and I, I've used this in a previous videos, this is an article having to do a homeopathy article, and they looked at what was going on here. It said, when an infected person expels virus-laden droplets and someone else inhales them, the novel virus called SARS-CoV-2, that's the COVID-19 virus, enters the nose and throat. It finds a welcome home in the lining of the nose, according to a recent uh, AR Ziv preprint, because cells are rich in cell surface receptor called angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2, ACE2, throughout the body. The presence of ACE2, which normally helps regulate blood pressure, marks, issues, uh, or marks tissues potentially vulnerable to infection because the virus requires the receptor to enter a cell. So this thing with the AC, ACE2 receptor that marks a cell potentially vulnerable to infection, but the virus is beginning to link up with that receptor in order to enter a cell. 
Once inside, the virus hijacks the cell's machinery and makes copies of itself. And you see this in all the symptomology. It's not even necessarily primary blood. 20% had heart damage. Again, these are all the secondary effects of this blood disease, okay, ending up in the heart. Another with uh, arrhythmias, 44%. Kidney injury, okay. Neurological symptoms, nerves, and we're going to get into that, okay even things like pink eye and so forth. So much of them, again, based in the blood, not in the, in the lungs. The lungs is where it's transmitted. And here's another thing that, you know, you get conspiracy theories all up in arms. Because you have three things in this COVID-19, as I explained in hybridizing harm, that suggest it was actually manufactured. You have SARS backbone, and SARS is normally basically solely a respiratory disease. You have an HIV fragment that allows this virus to mess with the regulation of the immune system. And it, and it, it, it allows for an, uh, a way to subvert the immune system, but also to use a protein spike to get into it. Um, and you have this gain of function uh, and you have basically evidence uh, of, of this gain of function to get uh, created in labs uh, to, and I, and I will, I will show that in, in a different video when I examine this, but that has what looks like a human derived glycoprotein or which is a sugar shell to hide the fact that there's a protein to camouflage this virus getting into the system. So we, we have now what is kind of a Franken virus um, able to both be transmitted through the respiratory system but also has a way and a function developed that allows it to get into the blood and mess with not only the blood, but the immune system as well, subvert the immune system. It's quite a combination because if we looked at HIV, remember the early times when everyone was scared, oh, you're going to get it from kissing and all, you know, all these sorts of stuff. No, it actually was intravenous drug needles and sexual contact um, and really probably fairly vigorous sexual contact, contact in the fluids in the body being exchanged that really created the problem. Now you took the worst of both worlds. SARS is very, it communi uh, could communicate very well through the air and it was a very serious virus. You connect that with a sort of HIV-like function, whether or not it was created in a lab or somehow got there, we will discuss that. I'm not gonna make a lot of um, predictions or arguments on that, but the fact is these two functions have gotten together in this SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now you got something that can be transmitted very easily and then has a function to subvert the immune system, get into the body and create big time problems with clotting and the blood flow. So you have a dangerous virus that brings out vulnerabilities underneath. And this may be why children are not getting it because they don't have a lot of those vulnerabilities. Or if they do, they have a more responsive system, a more resilient system. Um, so the anti-inflammatory effects of vitamin D in tumorigenesis. This is just uh, an article that shows that in general, vitamin D has an anti-inflammatory effect that plays an, down here an important role in the modulation of the inflammation system by regulating the production, again, of inflammatory cytokines. Cytokines are those flags that say, hey, attack this. Hey, come to here. That's when you get that kind of inflammation. You get the immune cells to come because they think there's a threat. Now, again, when you have autoimmune diseases and a dysregulated system, they begin attacking your own body. Um, and immune cells, which are crucial. So for, the, uh, for inflammatory cytokines and immune cells, which are cru crucial for the pathog pathogenesis of many immune-related diseases. So again, going after the disease. Here's a market watch. Um, uh, again, on these, um, I'll go ahead back to that other one again. Oh, yeah, there it is. You, you've already seen the paper there. Um, Market Watch does a decent job just sort of summarizing this. I'm going to go ahead and uh, go there. No need to go all the way up. You have the thing. It says patients from countries high COVID-19 mortality rates, such as Italy, Spain, and United Kingdom, had lower levels of vitamin D compared to patients in countries that were not as severely affected, according to the study. Now, I suggested some of it had to do with the use of vaccines in my past videos, uh, creating or contributing to this abnormal immune response. And there was some uh, research, some significant research that supported that. 
And it could still be the case, but it also looks like vitamin D is also case. Because even if you had those crap that comes in from vaccines and so forth, interrupting and complicating your immune response, this vitamin D would help to buffer that effect. As, a, as his research has found here, a strong correlation between vitamin D levels and cytokine storms, which is hyperinflationary condition or hyperinflammatory condition caused by an overactive immune system. So again, there's lots of things. Remember, um, remember those vaccines had what these things called adjuvants, which are meant to make your immune system overactive in order to incite. Now, it doesn't distinguish between a pro-inflammatory response, which is not good, or these binding antibodies and, and these neutralizing antibodies that are meant to go in, take out the uh, and neutralize the uh, the virus. So I still think that vaccines and the crap that are in vaccines can be a complicating factor here, maybe even depending on what's in the vaccine, the primary complicating factor. But it's very clear it's not the only factor. Vitamin D level may be more important and a more primary factor for most people, and certainly the research supports the correlation between vitamin D deficiency and mortality, COVID-19, more strongly than research around the effects of immune um, uh, vaccines and immune responses. I, I believe they both, uh, and it's already been proven that they both have, a, have an effect. And if you got both of them together, I think they would probably have an accelerated or amplified effect. So here we have the guy who did the research, Vadim Bachman. He says, while I think it's important for people to know that vitamin D de deficiency may play a role in mortality, we don't need to push vitamin D on everybody. He says, this needs further study and I hope our work will stimulate interest in this area. Perfectly polite response, <laughs> but the science is pretty clear, right? Um, it, 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 at least in beginning to, to target this. Um, this again is in a WebMD um, uh, article. It says the link, uh, the research linking vitamin D levels, and it goes up here, more vitamin D, lower risk of severe COVID-19, question mark. It says the research linking vitamin D levels and COVID-19 cytokine storm is also just starting, but not surprising, says Bart Rope, PhD chair of the Department of Diabetes Immunology at City of Hope, a cancer center in Duarte, California. Here's the important part. Vitamin D says it's a negotiator because it doesn't suppress the immune system, it modulates it. Vitamin D makes immune cells less inflammatory. This is so critical. Vitamin D is not just like a chemical or a drug. This is the problem with so many drugs that you put into your body. They create effect and they have side effects because they're meant to do one thing. In this case, it would be to suppress the immune response. Then it creates a problem with you being weak when you actually need an immune response, when an actual disease comes in. Vitamin D helps to modulate the immune system and balance it. And the immune system is a kind of balanced system. What you want is homeostasis, a balanced system between pro-inflammatory response, which goes after uh, some kind of foreign protein legitimately, but also anti-inflammatory um, materials that help bring that down once the, once the job is done. If you have these pro-inflammatory ones that go into a storm and they can't be brought down, then it just starts to attack your body, your blood, your organs, and so forth. Vitamin D helps to create that balance between those two and allows both of them to have their proper relationship. It doesn't just like drugs handle one or the other. Again, I say this because we have to begin to work on holistic health practices that focus on balance, homeostasis, and buffering rather than just trying to take care of a narrow specialized problem and then creating a whole host of other problems because we just didn't see things broadly enough. You saw that with ventilators. You saw that with a lot of uh, responses to this COVID-19. People are not looking at the bigger picture, connecting the dots in this complex system. So this is again from the Medical Express. Um, uh, vitamin D appears to play a role in COVID-19 mortality rates. By analyzing publicly available patient data from around the globe, Beckman and his team discovered a strong correlation between vitamin D levels and a cytokine storm, a hyperinflationary condition caused by an overactive immune system and a correlation between vitamin D deficiency and death. So mortality meaning death rate. Cytokine storm, this is a quote, can seriously, severely damage lungs and lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome and death in patients. I.e., you'd have the wrong immune thing, you have the wrong blood, 
it's going to seriously damage your lung and can create respiratory distress. Okay, that's the presenting problem. It's not the root cause. Um, quote, this is what seems to kill a majority of the COVID-19 patients, not the destruction of the lungs by the virus itself. It's the complications from the misdirected fire from the immune system. Got it? Confirmation. <laughs> okay. Um, and if you actually get this vitamin D, because it enhances, quote, enhance our innate immune system. It also prevents our immune system from becoming dangerously overactive. It means that having healthy levels of vitamin D can protect patients against severe complications, including death from COVID-19. Couldn't get any plainer than that. And finally, this is a quote again, our analysis shows that it might be as high as cutting the mortality or death rate from COVID-19 in half, just that one thing. It will not prevent a patient from contracting the virus, but it may reduce complications and prevent death in those who are infected. Again, how can he make those claims without being, I think he's an engineer, not even a medical doctor, because of epidemiology. You look at the vitamin D deficiency levels in a population, and then you correlate that with how many deaths they have from COVID-19. And you begin to do the calculation and the math to arrive with the fact that almost half those people might be saved simply with getting adequate vitamin D to help regulate their immune system so it doesn't do that ridiculous clotting, doesn't create these complications which send the body into the red zone and eventually into death. Here's the actual paper. I won't go over it, but I'll just go ahead and put the screenshot up there. You have uh, and will have the references if you want the original paper. Um, uh, this one is, again, another scientific paper, evidence of vitamin D supplementation could reduce risk of influenza and COVID-19 infections and deaths, okay? So it's not as if we don't, this work, work isn't out there. It's not being distributed. Through several mechanisms, I'm doing the uh, highlighted section, vitamin D can reduce risk of infections. These mechanisms include uh, <clears throat> uh, catholicidins uh, and defensins that can lower the viral replication rates and reduce concentrations of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So not only can it help you know, with the cytokines, but can also limit the viral replication um, of COVID-19 produces inflammation. Again, these cytokines pr produce this inflammation that injures the linings of the lungs, leading to pneumonia, uh, as well as increasing concentrations of anti-inflammatory cytokines. Okay. So moving on, this is what's happening here. And I said it before, your body has to have a homeostasis between inflammatory cytokines that go after an infection legitimately but they also have to be able to be turned off, okay? Um, oh no, these, sorry, I have it backwards. This is anti-inflammatory ones, right? If you have too many anti-inflammatory ones, you might not get the uh, adequate response to an actual invasion by another organism. But if you have too much inflammatory response and overreaction, this actual, uh, your immune system can actually attack your body. The problem with the COVID-19 virus is that it kind of goes into your system through cells, hijacked cells that kind of signal a problem. And if it's replicating and hijacking those cells, it's signaling that you're having a lot more of a problem than you actually do. So your body's going crazy, just sending all these uncontrolled inflammatory type cytokines to the site, causing this clotting, causing these problems with the blood. So again, with vitamin D, you have a better regulation of that your body is being able to distinguish what's happening to it better and has better capacity to deal with it. I'll just read here. Although cytokines are beneficial in the in, in initiation and coordination of immune responses, unregulated cytokine signaling inadvertently uh, constitutes principal determinations of immunopathology, giving rise to autoimmune disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis and hypersensitivity reactions. Again, so much of what's happening with not just COVID-19, but with our own autoimmune diseases and so much of the allergic and inflammation responses we have have to do with electronic pollutants, have to do with the diet that we're putting into our body, have to do with the fact that our medical profession is not designed to treat things holistically and comprehensively, but gives you a drug for this or that symptom, and it goes on and on. And I will also say vaccines and adjuvants that begin to create 
uh, these pro-inflationary type reactions and not distinguishing between that and an effective response to a disease, which is actually a balance between pro-inflationary and anti-inflationary um, uh, aspects of your body. Uh, and that's what everything should be guided toward is balance, homeostasis, health, holism, if we really wanna do this effectively in ways that will meet future pandemics as well as this one. So what's going on here? I'm just gonna go through really quickly and um, uh, get to a couple of these other things. Live science says that uh, obesity um, causes vitamin D deficiency. Um, again, we talked about, oh boy, let me see if I can go to another one here. Okay, here are some of the problems that, um, that vitamin D deficiency can cause, okay? Uh, or, or can be helped by when you have, a, um, if you do not have enough vitamin D, here's some of the problems that can happen. Uh, diabetes, again, vitamin D helps to provide, uh, produce hormones that regulate your blood sugar, heart disease. We've already kind of gotten into that. Vitamin D can help your blood vessels relax and widen and can prevent inflammation and clotting. We got into that. Cancer, as you can tell, cancer is largely an inflammatory disease. Dementia, a lot of dementia has to do with vascular dementia in the brain. Again, problems with the blood and the brain function. Um, uh, depression, uh, again, getting in uh, happy hormones, uh, again, regulation of body systems, vitamin D is really important, erectile dysfunction, osteoporosis. Um, let's see if we can go back to this one. Let's see if, we, there we go. Okay. Obesity is linked to vitamin D deficiency. Being obese can cause a deficiency in vitamin D. So again, here we go back to the medical thing. They say obesity is a risk factor what they didn't say is obesity may actually be the causation. Obesity decreases vitamin D. And as we saw, without that vitamin D, you don't have the regulation mechanism. So obesity isn't the direct cause, but it's the indirect and important cause of lowered vitamin D. And that may be the direct cause of dysregulating the immune system and causing the complications in COVID-19 patients. Um, here we have uh, vitamin D and obesity supported in an actual peer-reviewed publication. It's a significant health problem, as this thing says, and vitamin D deficiency is pandemic and implicated in a wide variety of disease states. This paper seeks to examine consistently reported relationship between obesity and low vitamin D concentrations. So there's another scientific paper for you. What else happens? All the electronic pollution, it's again, not 5G that causes <laughs> the disease. COVID-19 virus and uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a real thing, but here's the problem. Electromagnetic waves, including 5G, can have a very significant and scientifically proven disruptive effect on your mitochondria and your homeostasis and your blood system, okay? Look at what it says here. In black and white, we concluded that exposure to mobile cell phone radiation and 5G and other forms of radiation compromises the immune system of rats and vitamin D appears to have a protective effect. So if you are around a lot of electronic pollution, Vitamin D supplementation or making sure you get outside and get the sun and be active becomes an incredibly important personal health decision to make. Evidence that vitamin D supplementation could reduce risk of influenza and COVID-19 infections and deaths. You know, I, I think I might have already referenced this one, but I will, I will go ahead and do it again. Through several mechanisms, vitamin D can reduce risk of infections. Uh, yes, I did. I, I did show that one, including catholicidins and defensins and lower viral replication. But here's the um, original article on it um, and the good citation there. Uh, a rapid review. And then after all of this, look, you get this kind of crap. I'm throwing in here to show you the industry when it comes to opportunism and real science, whether or not this industry is in support of it. Of course, vitamin D would be a lot cheaper and probably a lot more effective than so many of these therapies. Are we going to allow that to happen? Or we're we going to have sites like this, the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine saying, 
vitamin D, a rapid review of evidence for treatment, we just saw all that other stuff. And this, this was May 1st of, of this year, just a couple of weeks ago. And they said, I, we found no clinical evidence on vitamin D in COVID-19. There's no evidence related to vitamin D deficiency predisposing to COVID-19, nor were there studies of supplementation for, for preventing or treating COVID-19. Notice how they're using the language here. No clinical evidence. There's statistical evidence. It's overwhelming. There's a lot of previous research that ties vitamin D with immune system problems, obesity, and all these complicating factors. But they're like, well, you don't have it exactly for this right now. Really? In a disease that's a couple months old? And you're not gonna take any of these factors and not mention any of these factors? I mean, I, I find this to be literally morbidly negligent and clearly self-interested. They are actually developing clinical trials right now to directly <laughs> investigate this question. They say, again, no one has produced it in humans, but reduced levels of vitamin D in calves have, have positioned as the main cause of bovine coronavirus infection. Get that. There have been studies on this, but they were with calves and there were studies with coronavirus and they showed that there was a, a direct link between that and coronaviruses, which COVID-19 is a coronavirus or the SARS-CoV-2. Therefore, it seems plausible that the use of vitamin D as a nutritional ergon ergogenic could be a potential intervention to fight against COVID-19 infected patients who remain asymptomatic or which have non-severe and severe symptoms. Duh. So at least they're doing it. Again, it looks like they're looking to call people into this trial. And they also have another trial, another clinical trial here, uh, COVID-19, a randomized controlled trial, high dose versus standard dose vitamin D3 in high-risk COVID-19 patients. Thank heavens someone's trying to do this, but it's not <laughs> supported by drug companies. But again, it just says that SARS-CoV viruses enters the cell via the angiotensin converting enzyme that's ACE2, one that I talked about. Coronavirus viral replication downregulates this. Okay, the AC2, thereby dysregulating the RAS system we talked about that leading to a cytokine storm in the host causing acute respiratory distress. Do you see that? It gets into this ACE2 receptor, downregulates this receptor, dysregulating the, uh, in this other RAS system, leading to a cytokine storm causing acute respiratory distress syndrome. It's not the syndrome which is the cause. It's the thing that comes about five steps down the line. When you get to the root cause, then you can treat a disease. When you just try to treat the symptoms with ventilators and stuff, you cannot. Uh, research also shows that vitamin D plays a role in balancing RAS and reducing lung damage. On the contrary, chronic hypovitaminosis D, that's just a clever way of saying vitamin D deficiency, induces pulmonary fibrosis through activation so this RAS overactivation creates this pulmonary fibrosis, which is another way, uh, basically another way of calling clotting. Pulmonary fibrosis is those clotting up in these small uh, sacs in your lung. And, and, and having vitamin D deficiency also is strongly associated in the literature with acute respiratory distress syndrome. So we have the research out there. They're already describing the research and they're acting on clinical trials. But again, you have some scientists who want to ignore that and replace it with a bunch of expensive drugs that probably are not going to be nearly as effective. Here's another one. Okay, mostly false. This is actually a German one. So it's not even American. You know, American drug companies are ridiculous anyway. We know that. And they have bought and sold the science in our country, but in other countries as well. It says mostly false. It's mostly false that taking high votes of vitamin D against COVID-19. Um, it's mostly false that 5G harms the immune system. Again, all of these things are created, are already proven and shown to have great uh, correlation or even just studied uh, causal effect in, in the papers I've just shown you. And again, you have this kind of crap coming up. This is a translation of that German article. Um, it says, again, look how they try to do manage the language to avoid the actual question. All seriously ill COVID-19 patients have vitamin D deficiency. 
You should take high doses of vitamin D and vitamin C. See how they did that? You see that on a question. Whenever you see that on a multiple test question, you know it's false. Because all means literally 100%, not even one excluded. Okay, stop making a silly statement. Say most, okay, or a vast majority of them could benefit from this. That's an actual claim. And what would be the harm? Um, again, he said, in our research, we were unable to find any reliable sources for the claim that all, again, all seriously co ill COVID-19 patients had a vitamin D deficiency. Now, again, it, by trying to make the question be such that it's impossible to say yes to that, you then discount the ability to move forward on really promising and inexpensive treatments for COVID. So how do I know, how do you know if you have a vitamin D deficiency? Okay, those are the things, um, you know, this talks about some of the levels, some of the sources of vitamin D. The important sources of vitamin D, I'm vegan, so literally I have to get it directly from the sun. If I want vitamin D3, I have to get it from the sun or compromise by, by vegan a little bit by getting it from these sources. Uh, the oil that is in vitamin D capsules, D3, tends to be from cod liver oil and these kinds of things. You can get it from mushrooms, okay? But it's, I think, vitamin D2 in there, okay? Um, and sun, even a, a small exposure, what's happening is that people are combining staying inside, playing on video games and getting all this EMF radiation, electronic pollution, and staying outside of the sun so they don't get their vitamin D. And uh, studies show that the younger people are getting less and less vitamin D. Deficiency is increasing all over the world, both because electronic pollution depresses your vitamin D level and then also creates problems with your metabolism, not just the sedentary nature of sitting there playing video games, but literally your body chemistry and your metabolism being interrupted. So you're literally getting fat as you're getting pollution from this electronic pollution. And this vitamin D deficiency is only accelerating that obesity. And of course, we know that obesity is multi-trillion dollars of liability, lost productivity, medical expenses, and so forth, may be the number one problem the world over when it comes to actual damage to health. So again, people who need to be more worried about it, older people, uh, you need to con consume more with age, people with darker skin, because the melanin doesn't allow there as much generation. Um, and again, you can do this through supplementation. You can also do it with a real exposure to the sun. I do take vitamin D myself. And currently right now, I am looking into a vegan form of it. But again, I was able to find that with, with uh, glucosamine. <laughs> There's a vegan form of it. And also with, uh, with long chain fatty acids uh, um, for... Um, uh, omega-3s. You can get them from algae and you don't have to just get them from fish oil, but I'm still looking at it for vitamin D. Okay. Uh, for my health, I'll compromise a little bit on that. <laughs> um, so here we go. Uh, vitamin C also has um, can reduce cytokine storms and acute uh, respiratory syndrome. Uh, again, another peer review paper that shows that. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Vitamin D deficiency with UV light in patients with malabsorption syndromes. Again, part of the problem is this. If you are those people like we do who have, a, have an infrared light to help with healing and help with basic health, it will not produce vitamin C or vitamin D. Okay, so if you want vitamin D, you have to get it through ultraviolet light. Tanning bed would do it, yes. Um, being outside probably be even healthier than that. Um, uh, and this is about vitamin C too. It says the data show that vitamin C is only marginally beneficial when it comes to the common cold. Again, I'm trying to show both sides here. Um, the meme was posted and they talked about a meme circulating, uh, quotes a deceased doctor saying, I have not seen any flu yet that was not cured or markedly ameliorated by massive doses of vitamin C. Now, do you see again, the language they're trying to make these other people wackos and crazy okay, by, by making these extreme cases and, and pulling out this doctor, that doctor says, anything can be cured by it, okay? Um, you know, again, it's meant to dissuade you from the crop, proper uses of vitamin C here, okay? There are no vaccines or antiviral treatments that are recommended to prevent or treat the new coronavirus. 
according to the CDC. According to the CDC, however, we're going to show that other countries have tried this with great success. Patients, however, can receive supportive care to treat their symptoms. So they're kind of implying maybe vitamin C could to be a support mechanism, but not an intervention mechanism. Turns out that's not true at all. This is a great article, orthomolecular.com. Um, and it says, news media attacks vitamin C treatment of COVID-19 coronavirus, yet ascorbate is a proven powerful antiviral. It is a proven powerful antiviral, even in mainstream Western US science. But in terms of treating this disease, we haven't really gone after it like the Chinese and the South Koreans have. And they've gone after it with a great deal of success, apparent success. Again, you don't prove something necessarily in a clinical trial, but if someone's in really bad shape and you're doing a high dose vitamin C into them and it's improving their condition, then and in a way that can only be attributable to that high dose vitamin C, you're looking at the, the traditional profile of these patients with the exact same symptoms is like this without it. And then you put the vitamin C in there and it goes, up. <laughs> You can pretty much, even though it's not, quote, double blind, you know, research over year study, you can just use clinical observation to say the only thing we changed was vitamin C. And it really improved the profile of the patient or patients that were like that. So and this is in the afternoon of February 20th, 20, 20, 2020. Another four students with severe coronavirus pneumonia recovered uh, in this Tanji hospital. In the past, eight patients have been discharged from the hospital. High dose vitamin C achieved good results in clinical applications. We believe that for patients with severe neonatal pneumonia and for critical ill patients, vitamin C treatment should be initiated as soon as possible after admission. Numerous studies have shown that the dose of vitamin C has a lot to do with the effect of treatment. High dose vitamin C can not only improve antiviral levels, but more importantly, can prevent and treat acute lung injury and acute respiratory distress. We've already seen that in other things. It again is beginning to, it's an aid. It's aiding the internal homeostasis, creating the materials for your body to go into battle. And without that, you are not nearly as effective a warrior. And again, these are peer reviewed publications down here, which show that even small supplemental amounts of vitamin C can keep severely ill patients from dying. Peer reviewed journal 1994. Infants with viral pneumonia treated with vitamin C have, re have reduced death rate. 17,000, and I wouldn't recommend this. None of this is medical advice, by the way, people. I'm not saying do this. I'm not saying follow what I say. Just take it in, consult, and do your own research. Make your own decisions. Do not do anything I say as an implied recommendation or an outright recommendation. I'm just presenting the research. You make your own decision. Again, these are high-dose vitamin C. I don't take that much. I take a couple of thousand vitamin C per day. It just as a maintenance thing. And but only 200 grams, microgram, uh, milligrams, vitamin C, about a tenth of what I take, reduced duration of severe, severe pneumonia in children. Get this part too. Oxygen saturation was improved in less than one day. What's the problem that we have with COVID-19 patients? Oxygen <laughs> saturation. So hello. You, you, and then you have the scientists, well, you haven't actually proven it on a COVID patient and done an extensive long-term study. Guess what? They don't have any problem making vaccines and then just trying out willy-nilly on eight people and then go borrowing through trying to make a multi-billion dollar vaccine when this thing right here is already proven to have severe or severe significant health benefits with the exact symptoms that these COVID people are dealing with. We should be using it now. Of course, there's a lot, not a lot of money in it, so that's probably why it's not being done. This, I want to just show you where the CDC is, because I believe the CDC is just, it's, it's so compromised, it, it, it's, its corruptness is almost basically accepted at this point. But in those cases where a definite di diagnosis of COVID-19 cannot be made, but is suspected or likely, i.e. circumstances are compelling within a reasonable degree of certainty, it is acceptable to report COVID-19 on a death certificate as probable or presumed. In these cases, certifiers should use their best clinical judgment in determining if a COVID-19 infection was likely. However, please note that testing for COVID-19 should be conducted whenever possible. So when it comes to their own uh, science, hey, you know, if you feel it was involved, you know, and you're using your clinical judgment, this doesn't even match the studies that were done on vitamin D and vitamin C. 
those things were not just someone's whim or clinical judgment. They keep talking about, well, this hasn't been proven. And then they have an almost comical let standard here, which is nothing proven, just presumed, put it down on the death certificate. So that just shows you that they are really not interested in this level of science. Um, and I just wanted to, I wanted to end with this. Um, COVID-19 has been a revealer, a Rorschach inkblot test for our collective and individual psyches. Has the reality of COVID-19 brought you to responsibility, community, creativity, reason, faith, and getting real, an internal homeostasis and responsibility for your own system, or has it reinforced the old normal habits of ignorance, fear, and opportunism? What do you and we have to gain from truthfully and comprehensively dealing with this challenge? A lot, which I have revealed, and a lot, uh, and what do we have to lose by sticking with the worn out ways of thinking? A lot, which I have also revealed for you. It is obvious now that neither scientific technological materialism nor obedience to authoritarian religions or any other trying to get outside of yourself to listen to somebody and just substitute that person's narrow understanding for your own comprehensive research, decision-making and development of your own health in cooperation and in collaboration with other people we are now at a crossroads here, okay? So these gods don't serve us anymore. These specialist gods, whether it's religion or scientific materialism, they have had bad science, they have bad faith and bad outcomes to prove their practical and moral bankruptcy. So far, debate has been dominated by three entirely unhealthy and unworkable orientations, ignorance. We saw that with church preachers suggesting that God would protect Christians and then the church leaders themselves died from COVID-19. You have fear. Blinded by specialism, technocrats and neuroscientists keep changing their minds as to what the disease is and keep trying to recommend very expensive drugs, sometimes flipping 180 degrees in the space of days. And finally, opportunism, vaccine companies and big pharma driven by the profit motive and our collective trauma to see a drug and vaccine cash cow worth many billions. None of these are comprehensively looking at the science or connecting the dots with a conviction toward arming the person on the ground with good information and healthy, successful ways forward. This is meant to do that with you. We need to develop comprehensive, integrated, collaborative, internal health-based systems and external support of our developing our responsibility and our vitality. We don't need another religious leader, another pseudo expert, another compromised drug agent in uh, industry or the CDC simply recommending their partial responses, which create oftentimes as many problems as they solve which then more drugs and more things have to go into. We have to corral this, surround this COVID-19 and surround our health, see it in its totality and develop holistic, homeostatic, more balancing mechanisms that allow us to keep up with the natural evolution of viruses and bacteria and use that knowledge to create balance, not only within ourselves, but between ourselves and those viruses and bacteria, many of which are essential for our own health. Many of them are good. And even the ones that are not so good, the ones that make us uncomfortable, create symptoms for us, also teach us things like how not to stress, how to step forward and live a healthier life to be in balance with them. These are not bad things. These are good things. So, I, I, again, I hope this has been helpful. It's been longer than I thought it was going to be. It's gone over a little over an hour. But this is more than just a lesson about vitamin D or vitamin C. It's a lesson about how we contact information, how we can critically examine what's being presented to us and how we can move forward, not only individually and internally, but together developing the external supports to make our health more, less expensive, more enjoyable, much more vital and stronger, and not allow other people to prey on fear or ignorance or opportunism but rather our own to do the opposite. What is the op opposite of fear? Courage, to have courage to begin to face an effort to do the things necessary in our health. What is the, what is the opposite of, um, of, of ignorance, knowledge? That's what I'm trying to do with you right now, to really fill in the knowledge, not from a conspiracy angle, not from a specialized angle, but a comprehensive integrated approach with peer reviewed science. And finally, what's the opposite of opportunism? The opposite of opportunism is care care for one another, care for our bodies, 
care for how we live our lives and care and attention and awareness about the ways ignorant or unintentional or intentional that we're making decisions in our lives that uh, may not serve us well or serve other people well or serve this planet and mother nature well. Let's begin to go down that track. We now have an opportunity. Both regimes are following. The regime of big government, fascism, whatever you want to call it, you know, and this religious sort of just have faith in obedience and higher leaders. We are going to have to be the leaders. We're going to have to get across political lines and cultural lines to do the things we know to agree on. If we can help each other with our health, we can help each other with surviving, help each other with your economy, help each other with our local businesses, and really begin to focus on building things from the ground up and from the root, not from the symptom down. That's what that that's the big metaphor to take away from this. Find the root cause of the disease, find the root cause of health, find the root cause of problems in society, find the root cause of bad political leaders, whatever it happens to be, begin to find healthy, strong ways to address that and support that and then work our way from the bottom up. Anyway, um, I hope you've been, uh, this has been informative for you and um, I look forward to uh, sharing more knowledge with you. Uh, if you have time and if you've enjoyed this and found you've gotten something out of this, uh, consider donating. I have a donate button on the YouTube channel and also one on my website at uh, citizenzeus.com. And uh, send in suggestions. If you want me to do some research on something or you've uh, gotten an issue, feel free to contact me at Zeus at citizenzeus.com and share those concerns with me. And um, I'll, go, I'll, I'll go after it. <laughs> I'll at least answer you. But, uh, but until next time, again, thank you and blessings to you. And uh, I'll see you next time.